Hey, everybody, it's the Plant Based Business Hour. I'm Elizabeth Alfano, happy to be with you. So, as we wrap our minds around plant based burgers, I think we've all got that one, and the deleterious effects of, of cows and the uh, belches and farts that they leave us with. Thank you so much. And of course, the land and water that they use and how inefficient that system is. People finally understand, are starting to hear that message about how we can ameliorate our food supply system to innovate for alternatives. Okay, plant-based burgers, check. We got it. But as we consider not just our land and not just our water as resource, non-salt water, we also start to focus on our oceans, commercial fishing, catching species of fish that aren't meant to be in the nets and extinguishing those species, the plastic that is left in the ocean, of course, just human trash that's in the ocean, and climate change, according to the IPCC, the um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, there is a definite connection, perhaps not the only connection, but the definite connection between our human footprint on the planet and uh, climate change. So just general climate change, the increasing temperatures of the ocean all lead us to understand that our oceans are in a dire state. Yet many people around the world depend on seafood from the oceans to feed themselves. So what comes next? Because we know as business people, what we do is we innovate to solve problems at a global scale. That's how we survive as a species. And of course, if you're in business, there's also some room for not just the joy of, of solving a problem, but also capital gain. So we start to focus our attention on the alternative seafood market, not just the alternative meat market. That's why today I am bringing in the co-founder and current CEO of Novish Plant-Based Seafood. He is from Holland, but he's in London today. Mako Vandermeer, thanks for being with me. Hi, Elizabeth. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you. I'm doing well. So you are launching your products uh, from Novish, which has fish sticks and um, I call them fish fillets, uh, sort of like a fish burger as well. Some some great options that we'll talk about. You are launching next week at Expo East. So finally, the U.S. and Canada is going to get uh, your products. I believe you might already be in Canada, but the U.S. is finally going to get your products. Um, but I'm wondering if you could tell people, when did you start Novish and why did you start Novish? That's a very good question. I'm very happy that you asked me that. Uh, Actually, about three and a half years ago, I, I joined a meat company, um, a big meat company, a big Dutch meat cooperative. And on day two, I I suddenly realized what I had joined, this, this big meat company where all these pigs are slaughtered and uh, torn apart. And and I had never realized, I had never seen that, uh, maybe a bit naive. And, and already on day three, I thought I'm not going to survive here if I'm not going to do something about it. So... I launched a plant-based meat business within that meat company, a bit like some of the other meat companies are doing. And uh, and that gave me so much positive energy that, that the, the whole plant-based movement and trying to cre recreate uh, animal protein with plant-based protein. And uh, also because I have a bit of a technical food technologist background, that was even more exciting to, to find a way how to make a meat alternative. So I did that for about one and a half year launched products, sausages, meatballs, all plant-based. But every day I had to fight with my colleagues who were meat lovers, meat salesmen, meat slaughterers. And, and I, I became more and more remote from that. At the same time, my oldest son uh, uh, turned vegan. Uh, the, I, I started to read about uh, the planet, climate, uh, animal welfare. So, and, and before I moved into meat, I had been working in the fish industry for 10 years. So I've witnessed all these practices from close by and never bought it. And suddenly it came to me that maybe within the last 10, 15, 20 years of my career, I need to do something more sensible and more sustainable. And, um, and that is when I decided in October 2019, so two years ago, um, let's start a plant-based seafood company uh, because it's the next logical thing. And I knew about what was happening in the oceans because I had all this inside knowledge from working in the global fish industry and the global fish farming industry. And then the whole, like one and a half year later, when Seaspiracy came out on Netflix, everybody said, oh, we're so surprised. And now we understand why you do this. And, and it was nothing new for me because I knew those, those facts and figures behind the, what was revealed in this documentary. 
So, so we started, uh, I, I took my wife along, who is a very experienced food technologist, uh, with broad business background. Uh, I brought our present CTO along, who has been the, the, the technical founder of some other animal pro uh, plant-based protein companies. So we had these three very uh, eager, ambitious, business uh, savvy, uh, but, but very, uh, uh, how do you say that, down to earth as well. And we, we felt that we should really create a business in plant-based seafood, which is uh, aimed at flexitarians, aimed at mass market, uh, at very affordable prices to have uh, uh, reduced, the, almost be at price parity, let's put it that way, and to really drive the conversion. We didn't want some niche business in the south of Holland. We we wanted to almost make product available around the world. And and with our collective background, we felt we had the chance to do that. So that's what we did. And here we are. Mm. Oh, well, I'll say thank you for doing that. Thank you for using your expertise to help make the world a better place in a way that you know how to do. Uh, something that you said really caught my attention. So I want to focus on that for a second before we get to the actual products and what's in them and uh, the technology behind it, if you will, and, and, and where the market is going. But you said that you you sort of knew about the meat market because intellectually somewhere in your brain, you, you know, you, you knew that animals were slaughtered, but it was the actual seeing of it that seeing converted and, you? And smelling it. I think smelling that, it. I think and if anybody you would send into a slaughterhouse would come out vegan. I think it's, yes. if you see that with your own eyes and you smell it and you hear it, it's, uh, it, it becomes real. And otherwise it's like something theoretical. And yeah. Uh, yeah, I've interviewed Philip Wolin, the former vice president of Citibank globally, mm -hmm. and the same thing for one of his yeah. clients. He was visiting their slaughterhouse, and he said he left in the middle, threw up, went yeah. vegan on the spot, and couldn't yeah. wrap his mind around the horrors. And I guess that's really why Paul McCartney always says if yeah. factory slaughterhouses were had glass walls, of course, everyone yeah. would stop eating meat. So it's very interesting. Well, the nice that thing is that maybe to, to almost make a stronger point on that, I actually got a beef slaughterhouse. I emptied the slaughterhouse, yeah. took away all the slaughter equipment and, yeah. and built a brand new plant-based meat factory for that company. So it was actually even more and then that uh, made quite an impact in the sort of plant-based community in Europe that, that this meat company had really closed down the beef slaughterhouse and turned it into a meat factory. And I'm still waiting for somebody to offer me a fish factory, which I can close down and then and then immediately be on the right scale and having the right equipment and, uh, and go for it. So a small invitation to anybody running fish factories around the world. Uh, Okay, you heard it here on the Plant-Based Business Hour. Who is selling Mako or renting uh, their fish factory to him so that it can be a plant-based fish factory? Let me just, some of what the knowledge you're dropping here is very fun. I didn't know your personal story before starting this, although we do know each other. Um, so what was the company, the meat company? Can you share their name? And does it's that plant-based- It's Fire on Food Group. And the nice thing is I put a project team together who were taking when I did the product launch and, and build the factory, they took it to the next level and they are extremely successful now, but they are still a little bit a funny sort of uh, part of this big meat company. So they are kept completely separate, which I advised because I didn't want that, that initiative to get spoiled by the bigger company. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that has worked out really well. So uh, I, I still hear about them and they are in touch and they uh, do a really good job. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, well, so let's talk about the products and I can show here, I can share my screen for those watching us live. Um, let's talk about the products that you have at Novish. Um, I've tried your fish sticks and I love them. I made fish tacos. I, um, you can probably see that here, everybody. Yeah, I, I made fish tacos and of course I put them in salads and you've got your vegan so vish bites um no vish so vish bites and your vish sticks no vish sticks and your novish burgers and your chunks your fillets are all these going to be launching in the us the chunks and the fillets are the the, the prime two products and okay. the fish fingers and then the tuna which is not on here yet okay and so you do have a flaked tuna that is going to be yeah, arriving in the US as well, which is so great. So let me ask you, because people are always, you know, wanting to know what is 
in this product, because uh, many people are still wrapping their minds around what is alternative seafood, what is plant-based seafood. So what is in Novish? The, the main ingredient is, of course, to replace the animal protein with plant-based protein. And we have four sources of plant-based protein, which is uh, pea, wheat, rice, and faba beans. Uh, you could argue why haven't you included soy in that, which is what all the other plant-based meat products are made of. But we felt that uh, in in the industry, in the meat, in the real meat and fish industry, soy is actually under threat because of the, the fact that in Brazil, the Amazon is being burned down to make all this cheap soy, which enters into the feed of the uh, animals in Europe, which are then being slaughtered and eaten. Mm -hmm. A very strange system altogether, really. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and and soy is, is therefore, for, from our perspective, a no-no. Furthermore, it has quite a strong base order. Every plant-based meat product you, you taste, if you have a good sense of taste, you, you taste the soy all the way through. Yeah. And we didn't want to spoil uh, sort of our beautiful natural fish aromas with this soy taste. So both from a sustainability and from a taste perspective, we decided not to use soy, which makes it a bit more complicated, but soy has two big benefits. It's extremely cheap. And uh, secondly, it has, contains all the essential amino acids, which you need from a nutritional perspective. But we managed by using the right combinations of those four plant proteins to, to mimic real fish. And, and particularly the latest uh, range of products, the chunks and fillets are, are really nice, white and, and really flaky. Uh, and that is, I think, a quite a unique uh, thing. And a lot of people in the last two, three years have tried to convert their, their meat burgers into a fish burger by just replacing the, the meat uh, aroma or meat flavor with fish flavor. But it was still this sort of grayish uh, uh, chicken type st structure, which doesn't really resemble fish. And, uh, and we've really went for the all white uh, flaky uh, texture. Yes. Ultimately, you have to give people what they know and what they're expect to seeing. That's you right. can't yeah. ask them to make too many leaps. So um, I, I understand what you're saying. How long did it take you to come up with a combination of pea, wheat, rice, and fava? Because you're right. Most things are coming with soy. The, the, the first range of products uh, was the burgers and the, the first uh, uh, step at Fish Fingers. It took us three to six months because of all the collective knowledge we had. But then to really crack the, the sort of flaky white texture and to select the right the natural fish flavor, that took about a year. Uh, and, and, and we really had to work hard on that. We had many variations. Uh, and the tuna was even more complicated. That, that took one and a half year. We, we really had to work hard on, on uh, making sure it's not like cat food, but it's like a real tuna <laughs> yeah. in terms of the, the, the resistance when you bite, when the, that it bounces back a little bit. The, the chewiness, the, the obviously the flavor as well. So yeah. tuna was a tough one to crack. Uh. So um, when I cook at home, for me to make things taste like seafood, I use olive brine. I'm wondering if you <laughs> use any olive juice at all to do any flavoring. And I'm wondering if it's algae is there for yeah. you in the future. Uh, we, we are very focused on seaweed and algae. We actually... Uh, work with quite some uh, some some suppliers, and and there is still some some restrictions on the use in food products I see. of some of those products, which which doesn't make it easier. But uh, we are actually uh, have involved in some of the technology projects to to approve, get them legally approved, and to make sure that we are ready to to use them. Um, uh, in the end, I think it's it's all also about. Uh, what the consumer is willing to pay and what what he wants to uh, wants to get, and I think we have realized that we uh, we can offer anything. We can put omega three in uh, in a salmon burger, for example, but but that makes the burger fifty cents more expensive, and somebody needs to be able to pay that. And we can also take it out. It's omega three in real salmon is also fed through the fish oil, which right. is in the feed. So so you don't have to have it in. It's not natural to for a salmon to have fish oil in as, or omega-3 in. Uh, mm -hmm. So we, we, we are now more focused on really the understanding the, the chef, understanding the consumer, and really work back. How do they want to use it? How do they want to prepare it in the oven or in the fryer or in, in the pan? And then make sure that we uh, choose the right uh, solution, as it were, from a taste, texture, nutrition perspective. Uh, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it'll be very interesting to see what you end up doing with algae. So much protein there. So that that's yeah. always a nice one. Um, and algae, I believe, do I have this right? Algae not being a plant or an animal, correct? It's it's not an animal. It's not. Well, that we know. Yes, it's not an animal. <laughs> uh, maybe I'm wrong. I'm thinking of microbes are neither plant nor animal. Yeah. Um, so any, anyway, very, very interesting. So I have to follow up on this because you brought it up. Price parity. Obviously, it's always the first thing on people's minds. Yeah. And for alternative meat, that has really been a big sticking point. What's it going to be like for alternative seafood? Same issues? I think, See, uh, in general, same usually more curve. expensive. I Same think the, the big thing is uh, you have two parts of the, the, the whether you can be competitive. One is the ingredients yeah. and one is the, the, the scale. Like, can you use big equipment, make 20,000 uh, kilos a day, or do you have to use small equipment? And I think on, the bo on both sides, we still have work to do. We still have to select the right ingredients, which hopefully become a bit cheaper in future. We still have to uh, work on the scale, ideally get this old C fish factory and and produce 50,000 kilos a day rather than 10,000 or 5,000 kilos a day. And it's uh, and in the end, the idea is that our, in three to five years, we should be at price parity. So we are, we are now uh, rolling out. Our prices are now 30 to 50% above the, the real fish product. But we, we aim that, that it should be at price parity. And then if you have a really good taste and texture, then... Uh, uh, you can really launch this range of products. And and I've actually more and more started to avoid the use alternatives because yeah. our main target audience, like millennials, Gen Z, families with kids, they have grown up with this. And, and for them, it's not an alternative. It's just a new range of products, which can be very tasty and uh, and good for you. Yes, right. Um, alt, alt meat and alt seafood aren't alt anymore as the world no, switches. Exactly. Yeah. And, and the world will switch over, particularly with, with plant-based meats. We know that at least according to A.T. Kearney, the alternative quote now, uh, alternative market, so all the options that you have available to you, plant-based meats and uh, fermented proteins mm -hmm. and uh, cellular agriculture cultivated meat would be about 60% of the meat market by 2040. There are other st yeah. studies also giving uh, expectations by 2030. One came out from Blue Horizon and, and Boston Consulting Group, um, also saying that you know these numbers might even be low, and there there might be um, you know we might be close closer uh, even than 2040. So uh, very interesting there, I think, and I think the dominoes are going to fall very quickly. So mm -hmm. while there is a bit of a headwind right now for alternative seafood, I'll say that the Good Food Institute just launched their state of the alternative seafood market report. Mm -hmm. And it says that uh, in 2019, uh, alternative seafood, we keep using that word, but I'll just say, you know, plant-based seafood, all in all forms, um, not just plant-based, but also fermented or cellular, which really isn't to market yet, was about 10 million in 2019. It's 12 million in 2020. So it's a 23% increase, but we are talking about tiny, tiny numbers. The global seafood market is almost 160 billion. So we're not even really on the map well, yet. I'm happy for 10% uh, already. And if you get 10% of that, I'm also happy. <laughs> Say that again. I would be happy with 10% as well. But when do you think... 10% of the total fish market. Uh, I think fish you... is going to lag behind a little bit because in general, people believe that fish is healthy for you. And in general, uh, they don't care that fish gets slaughtered. So the, 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 there are still enough reasons to go for alternatives, I believe. But they are not as strong as, as in the case of meat. And uh, therefore, I think seafood will be lagging behind. But the, the big advantage of seafood is real seafood is rather expensive and therefore it's easier to reach price parity, whereas meat is so heavily subsidized and so dirt cheap that it will be difficult to keep sort of lowering the price uh, to that level. So I think the, the seafood can certainly grow very fast. And, and it, our belief is that in 2025, it will at least be 300 million uh, worldwide. Uh, and then we are just being very realistic and modest. Uh, but where we come, it's still a spectacular growth from the 20 odd million, which it is now at the moment. Uh, but it all depends on the, I, I visited now about 100 customers in Europe. And they uh, every time when I show the product, they love it. They say, oh, this is amazing. So tasty. It looks like the real stuff. And, and it's really, we just can't stop eating. And uh, 
but but still they find it difficult to be the first to put it on the shelf or on the menu so they they need almost to sort of get a little push to to be brave enough to be one of the first and 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 they they always ask me like oh is is such and so like tesco or walmart are they do they have it on the shelf then i want it as well it's like it, it's a bit sad maybe but it's it would be nice if there are a few more front runners who just have the guts put it on and and we have learned that if you put it on the shelf or on the menu or on, on your online store that you have to help the consumers in the first couple of months to uh, to find out what it's all about and to give it a try and then as soon as they've tried once they're addicted so it is in that sense we have this great model we just need to get them to try it once and then we're fine Mm -hmm. There's so much that you have said. And at the end of this conversation, because I haven't wanted to interrupt you, we will revisit soy and how it's a monocrop and how that's tied to the burning of the Amazon. We'll come to that at the end because I don't right. want people to not understand that connection. And you went through it pretty quickly. But continuing on this path, you dropped a number that I want to follow up on. So the Good Food Institute report is, the, is 2020 over 2019. So from 10 million to 12 million. But of course, we're in 2021. You've got Intel that, you know, is out already, even though 2021 has hasn't been a full year. Are you telling me the, that the alternative seafood market is now 20 million globally? Would it's be a big jump like from 12. Million. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's more like 20 million. Well, all right yeah. then. These are numbers okay. that are showing incredible growth, even yeah. though it's tiny. Yeah, but I say I don't agree with the 10 million number either. So it's I think it's I just see. a bit bigger and there there is hidden gems in the in the plant-based seafood world where which are not on the radar, which are not part of Nielsen statistics or IRI yes, I or see. whatever. I so, see. Okay, great point. Um, okay, so that was going to be one of the questions I asked you. So we know that there's a definite need for this product because mm -hmm. we know that there's a definite problem to solve. Again, mm -hmm. as business people, that's what we do. We solve problems on a global scale. And then there's mm -hmm. the benefit of the joy of solving that problem. And then also the financial gain of that sec secular trend. So we know there's a major problem to solve the, the death of our oceans and, and feeding ourselves from mm -hmm. same. Um, but... I'm interested to see, you were saying the grocery store buyers are very hesitant to be the first ones to put it on the shelf. But when you do get it to consumers, you're saying that they really like it and they buy it and there's no problem with taste. I'm wondering if you can share more of that intellectual leap that the consumer has to make. Is it hard for them to understand why they'd be having the alternative seafood I or are they just really uh... open to it? I think they're open to it. I think the the good thing is that they have been now been told for four or five years that to replace animal protein is a good thing to do. So I think and they that get helps. that with fish as well. They get they start to. I mean, it's easier to to understand it because they have been told on meat and chicken now for a couple of couple of years. And I think the sea spiracy has helped in a great way. I think that is, and I think that the people are worried about the climate these days. I mean the. The amount of discussions around climate and that people realize that oceans play a role on climate as well i think that that becomes more and even if you look at our co2 footprint which gets a bit sort of scientific but our our co2 footprint is much more favorable than ordinary fish fingers so the mm -hmm. so from any sort of perspective it's it's there should be enough reasons to give it a try but i think one of the problems is that there there have been fish fingers and fish burgers for a couple of years but it's back to what I just be said before. It's they, they were meat burgers with fish flavor, and they were yeah. not very tasty. Yeah. And that is, of course, the same what, what the real plant-based business is suffering with a little bit. If people have had a few bad experiences, yeah, uh, they, they need to be convinced to give it another try. And, and that is why, for example, we are going to list with the biggest Dutch retailer in, uh, in a week's time. And we uh, said that we wanted to put a label like a sticker a new recipe or improved recipe something like that I to see. almost show that it's not the same soy based uh grayish uh, uh chewy uh, fish finger but it's yeah. a more a juicy uh flaky uh nice white yeah. uh, fish finger yeah and it's you almost th those are little things you need to do and of course sampling is perfect uh, we have the chunks which are like great for veggie fish and chips if, if you taste one, you can't stop eating. We, we have launched them at the Nordsee fish restaurant chain where we are uh, on the menu with 300 restaurants in six European countries. And, and people buy the chunks and they, they eat one and they never, they never stop eating. So until it's, it's all finished and, 
and it's uh, that is a good sign, I would say. Uh, although yeah. at the same time, these these chunks are also a bit of a frustration because the fill the fishless fillets are very easy to understand, and everybody and the same as fish fingers and people have the way they know how to cook it, they know what to do with it. But the the chunks, like the fish and chip type fish chunk, is something new. Mm -hmm. And although everybody loves it, some people don't know how to sell it. Like, is it like a starter? Do you have to cut it up, put it in a curry? Do you have to just eat it with chips? Do you put it in a salad? I mean, and, and that's a bit of a shame that if you have a too innovative product, it's easier to have regular, like the tuna flakes is very easy. Everybody yeah. knows what to do. You can make a Subway sandwich. You can make a, a Domino's pizza. You can make a... That's easy, but something novel in terms of shape or size or filling is more difficult. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so is that your biggest challenge? Just kind of getting people used to the products or? Try it once. I think to, to once. get people to try it once. I think That's, that is, yeah. then we get them hooked on, on our product and we, and we find. And then it's even like I have many discussions with chefs where I say, you should just put it on the menu. Don't even mention it's plant-based. This is just now the choice. And that those discussions I like the best if if they agree it's a really tasty product. It's still a little bit more expensive, but okay. Uh, they make the portions a little bit smaller and they make the same margin. And 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 I would love that situation more and more that they just put it on the menu. They don't put a big stamp vegan or plant-based. It's just this is the new way of eating and it's very tasty and and people will love it. So uh, why not? That was going to be my question for you. If the retailers or the restaurants felt the need to tell everybody it was plant-based or could they just skip that step altogether and just say, you know, we've got a, a new product it's, to try it's, it's on the really, menu. It is, this market is extremely dynamic. They, yeah. When I had this, these discussions two years ago, th these discussions have changed completely. And, and, uh, and it's interesting also geographically, uh, countries which were lagging behind are catching up very quickly. I mean, we we launched in France uh, three weeks ago, in Switzerland, Poland, Denmark, and 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 it's the, these countries almost take a leap and they don't talk about alternatives anymore. They don't talk about plant-based or this is just a new range of very tasty products and and affordable and good for the planet. So it's a uh, it's interesting uh, that the dy dynamic in this industry and that's why you have to be very agile and and. And flexible and that is of course a big advantage of having running a small company with a global reach that you can really move quickly i mean uh, uh, we are in asia we are uh, hopefully soon in the us in canada and all over europe uh, middle east even and it's uh, all done in like one and a half year and that's of course the big advantage of having having business experience but also being a small agile company yeah. Yeah, your um, footprint ac across the globe has been really impressive. And I think the U.S. is sort of almost like your last stop. So I'm so happy yeah. that you're launching next week. But speaking of footprint, you also mentioned something else I wanted to follow up on, that you have a better CO2 footprint than actual yeah. seafood. Is that something that you'll be marketing on pack? Because I'm really waiting to we get to the point where people look at the price of things and then they also look at the uh, global yeah. Footprint, well, carbon well, I mean, footprint everywhere. If you if you uh, fuel up your car, or if you you see this, if you take a plane uh, flight, that you people get used to this. And the nice thing, like in Denmark and Sweden, two countries in the north of Europe, uh, they are have already uh, legally obliged that the, the CO two burden needs to be put on the packaging. Yeah, so like we it. obviously are very happy with that development, and we are preparing ourselves so that we have the right numbers and. And we are, uh, but we know that that we're going to be roughly much better. But we want to obviously know how, how much better exactly, sure. and and uh, and to support that with uh, concrete evidence. So we we do all the homework, and by the time we are ready in half a year or a year, more European countries will have followed, and uh, we can take advantage of that. Yeah, well, uh, tasting is believing, and that's really when people come along. So anything I can do, you know, yeah. through Plant Powered Consulting or whatever, to help you get out the samples in the U.S., yeah. I'd love to do that. Um, let me ask you. So we talk about challenges and what's the trickiest thing for people to wrap their minds around, and the distributors don't want to be first. All these sort of technical things as well. What happened? What took place that was much easier than you expected? Did anything just sort of fall into place? Um. Well, it's it's funny if you're a small company and you put in your own money. It's uh, it's like simple things like the name and the the logo. 
if you were in a big company, you would spend a lot of money uh, with yeah. an expensive agency and, yeah. and, and argue forever. And then we just uh, had a, a young designer contest worldwide where we got 200 submissions and we paid the winner 250 bucks or so. And, yeah. and we had this fantastic logo. Everybody loves it. Same with the packaging. I, yeah, same with too. the name. So I think it's the nice thing is if you, uh, what, what has been uh, fortunate you, you in a small company, you just do it. And and uh, and uh, and that is, I think, it has been the most uh, enjoyable. In bigger companies, you always have the, the the red tape and the bureaucracy and the procedures. And and here we, I just have to argue with my wife, which I do every day, and we <laughs> other co-founder, and, and 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 we challenge each other. We we uh, we, and then we decide, and then we go for it. And and maybe the best illustration of that is. Uh, is North Sea restaurant, which one of our flagship customers in Europe. Uh, we went there on the day before Christmas, or actually Paula and my wife Katja went there. And and six weeks later, we were in 10 stores. And, and another six weeks later, we were in 300 stores with a complete new design product, two new products, which we never made before, which we didn't even know existed. So it shows that the uh, if you are if you are set your mind to it and you prioritize your focus, and you know what you're doing. You can you can achieve. If there would be a, what is it, Red Lobster, or what is this famous? Uh, yes, it's a if chain. They, if they would come to us and say we want a tailor-made special, uh, let them give us a call, and uh, we'll be back in th in three months presenting them some unique uh, menu options. And you I can handle that kind of quantity. Yeah, yeah, we can. Uh, we have. That's the other big benefit of having an experience and a network that. That we know where we can go to uh, contract manufacture our products. Eventually, we might want to have our own factory, but uh, not for now. We have so many other priorities that, uh, and I would really love love to do that. I mean, uh, I would as well. Yes, Long John Silver's, Red Lobster, yeah, exactly. all of these kind of places. And, even and they uh, should. They should. And they should. I, I can I can give you three facts why they should do it. Uh, in the case of Nordsee, which was fairly traditional fish restaurant chain. Uh, they got a whole bunch of new young consumers, which never visited them before. They sold 20% extra on the on the menu items we introduced without any cannibalization, and they make the same margin on the products. So yeah. what more do you want? Big win, right. That win, basically win, win. is yeah. their, their reason for being. So it's actually bad business not to do it. And I think yeah, exactly. yeah. many are realizing that now, although yeah. more in the alternative meat than in the alternative seafood. Yeah, but that will come. I think it we need come. a few successes, which will then uh, spread. People spread the word and people will feel more comfortable about it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, well, and this is a bit more anecdotal, but one of my clients uh, is Veggie, and they are the largest online vegan retailer in the U.S. and now also in Canada. And they say by far their number one item, much more than Beyond Meat, is plant-based seafood, particularly plant-based shrimp, but that's only because plant-based shrimp is what's available. If they had plant-based scallops and fish sticks, et cetera, it's plant-based seafood is the largest seller at the moment, which I next think week is Friday, next week, Friday, when we're done with the show, they're going to be the first one we're going to call. Okay. So we'll, we'll talk after class as they say. Yeah. Uh, okay. So let's talk a little bit about the investment community. So we talked about yeah. sales, you know, we're going to, for the purposes of our conversation, we'll say hovering around 20 million. It's a a little bit of just a blip on the screen at this point, people. Uh, but we see these kind of numbers for investment. So in 2020, about 90 million was invested into alternative proteins for mm -hmm. seafood. So that's through fermented as well as cellular based and uh, just plant based. But now in just the first half of 2021, again, this information comes from the Good Food Institute, mm -hmm. a state of the plant based industry and plant based. Uh, alternative seafood uh, industry report, oh my word, um, it is 116 million. So already half of 2021 has surpassed in a significant way all of 2020. So you're seeing a lot of dollars flow into the space. Mm -hmm. How quickly do you think that's going to uproot the alternative seafood market? And I think the, uh, what, what excites me the most is that in uh, April this year, I gave a big uh, uh, main sort of speech on a global fish conference and uh, all the, the captains of industry from the fish industry were there. And I made a plea almost begging them like they should jump in as well. It's like as long as these guys stay out, then it's never going to become a serious business. Mm -hmm. But if they really jump on it, then uh, 
then I think it's really going to go somewhere. So it's and it's interesting that uh, Nomad, the parent oh. company of uh, the, the Iglo and, and the other frozen, it's a frozen food company in Europe. Yes. That they stroke this deal with Blue Nalu, which I must say big compliments for uh, for the team at Blue Nalu. After they had already signed up Thai Union and Mitsubishi to uh, seafood companies, which are extremely active in sustainability in general and plant based. And I just applaud that. And I think that uh, uh, those investments help everybody in the plant based world to really motor along and to build a business. And I think that the only thing, of course, with cell base, it's it's going to take a while, is my personal opinion, until it reaches price parity. And the big advantage of plant based is you can reach price parity right now much sooner and then we can really uh, get started straight away so the i think the investment community is is warming up to uh to the plant-based seafood now that they've seen the success of plant-based meat and dairy and and uh, what have you and chicken so i think the and we actually need some extra money as well because with a launch in the us mm-hmm. uh, as any small company knows it's all about cash cash and cash and and you can only spend it once. And if you need to fill the pipeline into the US with full containers, which have become a bit scarce and expensive, then it's it's good to have some liquidity. So the, that is something yeah. else we are looking forward to. Uh, discussions, further discussions with investors about it. Yeah, noted everybody. So uh, Novish is taking capital. Is that what I'm understanding? Making that's, it uh, short and sweet? Summary. Yeah, yeah okay. Exactly. Okay, uh, that's wonderful. But you also referenced that deal with Blue Nalu, which is a cultivated seafood, cellular agriculture seafood company yeah. out of San Diego. They have made a um, deal with Nomad, which is the, one of the largest, if not the largest. It's by far the largest. It's a massive uh, frozen food company. Massive. Uh, and they own the, the, the frozen seafood counter more or less in the yeah. in all the stores in Europe. Yeah. So my question there to you, it's a great segue, is seafood metaphor. So do all rising tides lift all boats? So how do you feel about cellular agriculture? Do you see them as a competitor? Do you think oh, no, uh, plant-based no. seafood lives next to cellular seafood it's without an issue? The, it's actually the other way around. We are actually in discussion with some of the smaller cell-based startups where we believe that our commercial network and our, our, our business skills can greatly benefit uh, some of these cell-based startups. What you see is there's a lot of almost like student uh, startups in in Europe, in Asia, who have some fantastic concepts and products, but they don't know how to commercialize it. And through our networks, we could much faster commercialize it or give them feedback. And as a matter of fact, I'm a mentor of four or five of these startups in in the plant-based world. Uh, I'm also the part-time consultant in Bright Green Partners advising companies on what to do in plant-based and that all helps to i think this industry is a lot about cooperation and partnership uh contrary to the the more traditional industry and that's what i like about it it's all geared about win-win doing things together rather than everybody on their own and fighting each other yeah i love bright green partners certainly know them they've been on this show and i couldn't agree more universities are an untapped resource so much energy and there's also research and funding there and new generation and their new ideas and their new vision for the planet they're all working on these enormous problems that we need to solve and as business people that is what we do as we said um well as we kind of wrap up here um you did talk about your goals to get to 300 million as a sector um, which would, you know, put a serious about a 10% dent into the entire global seafood market. Um, but I'm wondering if you can be more specifically about your goals at Novish and also your predictions for, let's say, the next five years in alternative seafood. Uh, sure. I think the uh, uh, first question, we want to aim for 10% of the 300 million in five years. So we okay. believe that we can reach 30 million fairly easy uh we're going to be break even in the course of next year great and then really need to invest to grow uh, uh globally uh and i think we have all it takes to achieve that so i'm i'm fairly confident that that will happen uh i think the the challenge is of course to broaden the the assortment and we are very busy with smoked salmon and with uh, raw tuna uh, and those products are very technologically challenging it's almost like a holy grail but we love holy grails and, and and we are very close to uh solving that on lab scale and now we're thinking about upscaling and buying machinery to make that on a larger scale and i think the uh, step by step we want to cover 
all the products. Uh, the last two days, I spent a lot of time with customers in the UK. I talked to chefs and, and category managers, and, and and we've got another 10 ideas of new products, anything from crab meat, uh, uh, another smaller prawns, uh, uncoated products. Uh, so we've got all these ideas, calamaris rings, and, and it's interesting that all of them are fairly easy. It's just a matter of which one do you go for first, which is the easiest to explain to the consumer, uh, the easiest to make next. And it's, it's uh, we want to progress uh, as soon as possible. So I'll put in my vote there. Calamari, please. Um, I oh, am seeing yeah, shrimp yeah. out and about. Uh, yeah. I'd like to see oysters. I'm seeing scallops a little bit, but really I'd like to see oysters. Scallops and we can do. Scallops we can do quite easily. And sure. uh, any scampi uh, shrimps as well. Uh, the the oyster, <laughs> I think that is a bit challenging. Tricky business. Okay, but uh, but calamari you can do. Calamari we can do. We have done it already, and we can do it. So yeah, I think that would be a big one. You know, those products that are breaded and fried, or breaded and baked, or what have you, I, they've seem to be the front runner. But what about yeah. whole? Filet. I mean, you do have a your fillets, but um, th these whole pieces of seafood. When do you see that coming to the market? It's not far away. I think we are looking at whole cut uh, fillets, uh, and, and we know how to do it. It's just a matter of having the money to uh, make the investment. It's okay. a couple of million investment, and uh, and then to tweak and fine tune the formulation. But it's yeah. doable. I mean, it's interesting. We we tried three D printing, which has been popular in some student startups. But that, that we don't believe in that. There's a couple of other technologies, and we we are rather advanced with one technology, which we keep proprietary. So I'm not going to divulge too much about it. But Fair we enough. believe we can make it fairly cost competitive, like just a salmon fillet uh, or or something similar, tilapia. Yeah, tilapia. I would think that that would be sort of. Yeah, that's a nice fish. I fast. sold a lot of real tilapia, so. Uh, I know what it tastes like. It was one of my favorites. Okay. Okay. Well, now you got to make it for yourself. There you go. You're exactly. your first Absolutely. customer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, okay. As we wrap up here, just a couple of personal questions. Always nice to get to know you as we have done today. Um, and such an interesting history and story that you have. So um, as you work on alternative seafood and before you did plant-based meats, thank you for both of those. What would you like to be known for? Um. I think that the, the, the cooperation partnership, I think for me is really important, whether it's with suppliers, with customers or with other uh, competitors. I don't never call them competitors, by the way, with other companies active in the field. Uh, I, I like to be seen as somebody who is very open minded for doing things together and not necessarily wanting to win more or, or to just gain or and uh, that's what I try to do uh, in every aspect of business. So. Hmm. It's wonderful. I think of that as the Holland way. I don't know if that's accurate, yeah, but that's yeah, how I, I think of Holland. Um, and, you know, you've been around the block a couple of times. What do you wish you knew 10 years ago that you know now? Uh, I think that the, the two things come to mind. First, how, how exciting it is to have your own company. Yeah, and I've I've been a few times before at the verge of, and then you are eventually too risk averse and you don't dare to do it, and you're you have like a corporate job and a salary and and mm. and 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 the, if I would have known, I would have done it much earlier. So I think that's mm. one thing, and I think that uh, I've been a bit naive about the, the 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 planet and about climate and just sort of being too busy doing sort of day to day business and. By the time you get older, I'm actually also getting older, unfortunately. You start to maybe become a little bit wiser. And, and obviously, it would have been nice if you would have been wiser earlier. But <laughs> We all wish it. that. Yeah, yes. exactly. A hundred percent. Let me ask you, because you're saying of oh, just how exciting it is to run your own business. And clearly, you're so good at it. And you have such a vision. And there is such a joy, I'll say. I usually call it the bingo effect of taking your skill set and aligning it with your passion yeah. such that that's the work you do. There is a lot of joy in that. And yet, you're getting older and there's that quality of life balance. Do you have any quality of life in, in the... Uh, let me rephrase. Do you have a balance? Or let me even get specific. How many hours a week are you at this? Uh, all the time but i think the nice thing is if you do something you believe in and you think it's very worthwhile and valuable and enjoy and joyful then it doesn't it's not seen as a job 
Right. Uh, so the, I think that is what it's all about. And I wish more people would have that same uh, fortune that they can do something which gives them energy and which uh, they thoroughly enjoy. Yes, 100%. A question that I love to ask everybody is, you're having a bad day. It doesn't go your way. You are working on saving the planet, but yet this one day has been a frustrating one. Is there a phrase that you say to yourself to get yourself back in the groove? Uh, it's funny. Well, may I should tell this little anecdote. We started back uh, like almost two years ago. And, uh, and on uh, early March 2020, we had produced about 35,000 kilos in food service packaging. They're ready to... Uh, conquer the world in food service in like four kilo boxes, cartons. And and then three days later, the whole global food service business fell went apart. into a major lockdown and fell yeah. apart. And we, and we were desperate <laughs> like for a day. It was a really bad day. And then the next day we woke up and we said, no, we have to go into retail now. So let's design some fancy retail packaging. And a few weeks later, we repacked everything and we were in a retail store months later. So it's it's the nice thing, of course, you can get really frustrated and 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 we could have been depressed for another one and a half year or or you just wrap yourself together and you and you start running again. And and we all do that, all three of us. And now the people around us who are helping us out uh, have the same spirit. So that's good. Pivot. Pivot is the name of the game. And being small and nimble allows you to pivot a lot faster. Uh, we talked a little bit earlier. There's been a question about what's in it. So someone is joining the podcast a little late and they're asking us, is this gluten free? So I want to tell people it is a combination of wheat. So not gluten free rice, fava bean and pea. And we talked about this earlier. The reason you're not using soy soy is this major mono crop. It is very functional. So a lot of plant-based yeah. meats use it because it it's cheap and it performs really well, but yeah. it is a mono crop usually because it is fed to animals along with wheat and corn. So why are we producing food? So we're cutting down trees in the Amazon and trees in other places, by the way, those trees that help us pull carbon from the air, we need to do that in these climate change days. Okay, but we're not, we're cutting those trees down. We're growing grains. Are we feeding those grains that have fiber and protein to people? No, we're feeding them to animals. And then we give those animals land, water, time, have they produced any meat yet? No, we're going to have to cut down more trees, grow more grains, giving those grains to people. Nope, still giving them to animals. So an extremely inefficient system. As business people, we don't like to see inefficiencies, particularly when the cost of those inefficiencies are not just our tax dollars and our subsidies, but that some people aren't getting food. It's a food security <laughs> issue as, as, yeah, as much yeah. as it's a climate issue. Anyways, long story we'll short. So fully agree. For very well spoken commending to you that you don't use soy um, as we look to change how we farm and not monocrop. Monocropping also is very hard on the soil and then the yeah. soil becomes weaker for lack of a better expression, gives off more carbon going in the wrong direction. We don't want to give off more carbon. We want to sequester carbon. So many reasons to not focus on monocropping. Um, and thank you for doing that. But since I'm talking about all these foods, these, you know, grains and peas and uh, mm -hmm. proteins, I might as well ask you as our exit question, you're running around, you're super busy, you don't have time for lunch. What is your go-to snack? Um, I think I, I like tuna wraps a lot, tuna avocado wraps. Oh, you do. And so you're using your own tuna in your tuna now avocado. I use my own tuna, but I couldn't before, of course, but now I can. So yeah. And, and our tuna avocado wrap is absolutely de de delightful. Yeah. If you, you don't want anything else if you've tried that. So. Yeah. Uh, for those of us in the United States, sometimes we're not always the front runners in the world, folks. Sometimes we're behind the eight ball. And I will say that in plant-based seafood, I was just in Iceland and I thought, well, Iceland's not going to have one thing that isn't from the sea because, you know, they're Iceland folks, they're an yeah. island. And I had plant-based seafood everywhere I went and I couldn't believe it. So, and not just um, things that were fried. I had a couple of whole uh, cuts as well. And so, you know, I think Europe is much more open to this as they listen to the UN and the SDG, Sustainable Development Goals, and they start to take these things in mind. The, the um, 
UN, which through the FAO, the uh, Farm and Agriculture Organization, and the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the UN has been very outspoken about a plant-based diet is one of the best ways to uh, clip climate change, I'll say. So you the, the, the EU is beating us here. Let's get with the program, folks, and uh, catch up. So I am so happy that Novish is now available in the United States as of next week at Expo East, which means a bunch of distributors will buy it there. So probably look for it in stores maybe three months from now. Is that yep, fair? That's the, plan. that's the target. That's the target. And then you and I are going to talk after class about how I can help well, you. But every, you. everybody, Great. I want to thank you watching on LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, and uh, Facebook. Thank you for being with me. I will thank see you, you all next enjoyed. Tuesday. Mako, you don't go away. We are oh, also okay. grateful for what you do. Stay put. Everybody else, see you next week. Mako's just a dream. We appreciate you. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.